Welcome back. You're listening to another episode of The Todd Donald Show, a weekly podcast where artists and performers go to chat about nothing. Hosted by Canadian singer-songwriter Todd Donald. Hey, I'm still in the Arctic Circle. This is, of course, The Todd Donald Show. I am a singer-songwriter that started a podcast in 2008 to chat with other artists and being in love with art and artists and performing and performers, I opened the same loving arms to artists and performers in any and every category. I love chatting with, with us one-on-one and getting to know us, whether it's deep conversation or pure bullshit. And I've been away from this for a little bit. The last episode went up in the middle of March. Since then, and even before, I've been through some throes of indecision as to whether or not to continue doing the podcast. And after several breaths, and weeks of stillness, mind you, since the beginning of the year in my case, I finally just said, fuck it. There are still many people I'd like to chat with, to chat with again, perhaps. And this, as we all know, is a time when chatting, it, just to chat, vital. So just keeping alive your ability to speak and not having to practice on a volleyball is good practice. So welcome back. This may return to being a weekly podcast, but I am also professionally editing podcasts for others and working full-time up here. So I'm officially promising right now that there will be new episodes when I get to them. So there may be one this month or two or weekly. So please be diligent and caring and follow me to find out when they're available on Instagram at Todd Donald Show. And I'll do my part posting when they're available. Or just be kind and subscribe and tell your friends too so that they can join in the fun. So I'd like to now introduce Montreal's Peach Guevara, uh, an amazing singer-songwriter, in my opinion, whose 2019 album, Nude, was on full repeat in my car from the time that we got in contact on Instagram in November, I think, until the last time I got to drive my car at the end of the year. Uh, We had a very nice chat on the phone, basically doing the interview that I wouldn't be able to record in person yet and was hoping to one day in some possible visit to Montreal. I also found her bio fascinating and I completely forgot what I learned from you, Uh, but I'd like, I'd hate to tell the listener something they can't find out on their own on Facebook, but you're a singer songwriter. Yeah, I am. (laughs) (laughs) There we go. That is, yep. That is what I, what I do. (laughs) Your website gives a very fascinating bio. And that's how I learned that we both of course have this um, in our backlog of taking broadcasting. Yes, which uh yeah, it's a it's a it's a fun world, the broadcasting world. And I find when I meet people who are into say radio or a- any sort of avenue with broadcasting, there's just like something that you bond on and I think it's just like a really like from for most perhaps, but like a really big love for music, I would say. And a, the kind of love where it's like you're talking about a song as if it's like your child opening a, up a Christmas present, you know, it just like, it just means so much to you and makes your entire world. I do miss um, playing gigs a lot, which was yeah. the second half of the 2000s that you would have these conversations very in-depthly with other more introverted, creative, obsessed with yeah. art and music folk. Like it's like you're around your people yeah. And these these conversations are a big part of your life. Maybe you're saying everything and nothing, but it's not the conversation you can have with just anybody. Totally. Yeah. yeah. The way I, I just like go on rants about a song or a band, I can just see some people be like, wow, you're <laughs> intense about this. <laughs> That's something that I appreciated right away. So as I mentioned, when I was trying to read speak, my yeah. thoughts and feelings in the intro. I posted something about our mutual friend, uh, singer songwriter Tay Lin, being on the podcast, yeah. and you responded to the story, intending for it to be a message to Tay Lin. Yeah. But then we started chatting, and I just went to your Instagram page and took a listen to your tunes, and I'm like, okay, I've been waiting to hear something like this so badly. It uh, <laughs> it demonstrated just in itself that you're someone who has particular values in terms of how you want to craft your songs, your songwriting and and how you perform it. And I'm going to stop telling you what you are. (laughs) How did you find yourself doing that for lack of a better question? 
Well, you know, it was so interesting when I was recording nude. Meaning you were recording it without wearing any clothes. Exactly. No, I'm kidding. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But in a way, yeah, I was recording nude because I I was coming from such an honest place because the original intention, I wasn't going in thinking I'm recording my album today. I was going in just to record out of friends like we had talked about recording and finally like after months and months and months we finally managed to get it to work out so I went over to do that and at the time I was I'll be honest I was going through a fucking terrible time my partner and I of like two years were breaking up the same month my cat had died who I'd had for like 10 years and I had no foundation at the time I was just really really I just really needed to get it out Mm -hmm. because, you know, I still had to, even though I was going through all this bad shit, you know, like you still have to go to work. You still have to be out there in the world. Right. The show must go on. I'm someone. Pardon? The tragic, the show must go on even through hell. Exactly. It's like, well, life sucks, but I still have to make sure I have food on the table and have to go function, even though I, I feel like shit, I guess. When I got to go record, it was just finally I could just let it out. Had I not been in that mindset, had Nude been planned more and more organized, had it not been so spontaneous, and because maybe had I intended on recording the album, I would have been like, no, like let's record it when I'm in a better mindset. Like right now, I'm not in a good mindset. It, I just feel like that in itself just gave the album so much more emotion. And so much more honesty Yeah. than just like playing these songs and trying to like fake the tone. Right. Because like Nude, it's not, it's not really like, it's not really an upbeat album. It's, <laughs> it's like, here are my flaws and here are my grief and my pain. And I'm okay with that. I think it's good for any artist to have that be a part of their body of work. I mean, yeah, yeah, not not everyone looks at what they do as a body of work. Some people are just trying to make the best thing they can at the time. Yeah, cause I, th- I think even with the recording process, like songwriting itself, it should come from a sin- sincere place. So I think even with recording, there should be some more sincerity and authenticity with that, where it's like you're not forcing it. Or you're you're not trying to live up to an idea of what you should be. Yeah, that's, exactly. Because even listening to Nude, there's some parts where I'm like, oh, fuck, like my singing could have been better there. My strumming could have been better there. Like all these things that could have made it more like clean and mm-hmm. sellable, I guess. <sighs> sure, it would have made it sound better, but it wouldn't. <laughs> For me, all of the things about the way I'm hearing what I'm hearing, whether I'm listening to the album or one day, hopefully, God damn it, seeing you on stage. <laughs> Yeah. I'm hearing exactly what I want to. I'm hearing all things I love. But with every snapshot that is an album that you make, you get to make it differently. And as I understand, yeah. you are recording a new album. Yeah. At, w- at what point in recording it are you? Currently nowhere. Actually, <laughs> it's really funny that you ask that. I had a completely like new idea for approaching this album. And... Now what it's turning into is there's going to be like a first half and a second half, basically. So the first half will probably have 10 songs and then the other half will probably have like maybe another 10 songs, depending on what I come up with. I'm really excited to have this new project. And I mean, like this is coming from a very personal place. There's a lot more storytelling throughout the album, which I'm really excited about because Unless I've like specifically made a playlist, I will usually, if I'm listening to music, I'm going to put on the first song of an album and listen to it all the way through. Like, that's just how I like it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, When you're writing an album, that's like basically a chapter of your life, right? Or like almost like a a book, really. Really, it's a book and each song is a chapter. So to, to hear the entire album... It's a journey. It's a process. And it's when you find something that like really hits you in all the right spots in different ways, it's just, it's a really lovely experience because yeah. you just, that's just, it's another way of connecting. Right. And especially during a time of COVID, like listening to music has been 
really helpful and beneficial to me because it's a way for me to connect with people over ideas or a certain feeling that you get from listening to a song without having to be with people, you know? Like when mm -hmm. I'm lonely, I usually listen to music. <clears throat> I definitely recall a different time in my life where there was a lot more room to fill. Yep. That time of connecting to albums. It blows my mind to think, yeah, I probably spent time just listening to music. Oh, without yeah. E without even idly doing something else with it on. Weird. No, just listening, just enjoying the process, just enjoying the the experience. Would you, with your intention, look at making an album as a group of the best songs? Or do you feel like... So, some people think yeah. of like creating, crafting the perfect show, meaning uh, a stand-up comedian says, in order for the audience to get the most rounded experience, I'm going to talk about life and death and love and sex and this and it's going to be in this order so that you have the intended experience and like yeah. wow that was a movie with a beginning a middle and an end in some way i think that's definitely what i intend to do with this album for me i'm a like i don't give a fuck like i'm someone who who practices tarot on the daily that's my way of finding sanity in this world for me, this next album is inspired by the Tower card. And the Tower is all about collapse right. because of a weak foundation. But because of that collapse, you learn how to build again, build something stronger, more stable. And it's, yeah, it's about transformation, you know, with Phoenix rising, whatever. Yeah. Um, and that's what this next album is about because that's what my my life has been the last year and a half, two years or whatever. It's just been like my world being ripped apart and then molded <laughs> into something but totally new. I think that's a beautiful thing though too because one might never know what they were doing that wasn't working for them until they had yeah. to rebuild. Okay, well, I, this wasn't working for me before, so I don't need that or whatever. Exactly. It's a hard lesson and it's it's about letting go and that is something that I have struggled with my entire life not being able to let go of things. Right. This album it's quite therapeutic for me and I'm hoping what I can share with people can help them not have the same struggles that I've had. Right. Uh given that I fucking love the work that you've done so far add you know, the promise I'm getting of that same artist making another album, period, to uh, yeah. said, I'm looking forward to it already. And I think that's such a bodacious concept, the tower. You know, you can apply that to everything that's happening right now. What were we doing wrong that made it so much in, a, in our day-to-day -day practices of cleanliness and, and germs and sanitation? I feel like we're really seeing that right now. And I, as you were mentioning, like getting into germs and stuff like that, you know, we're seeing this globalized, free market, hyper capitalist world that we're in. And it's not working. That's why we're so fucked right now by this virus. Right. <laughs> I don't want to sound like a fucking scientist because I know I'm not. And I know that we still don't really know why this happened or how this happened. I think it's here to be like, here's your last shot to get this right, human race. Like, this is crumbling. Let's build Let's build something better if you want to. Yeah. I see this happen to myself. Like, I have repetitive patterns. And I'm like, why, why did that happen again? And it's because, you know, I'm not taking the opportunity to build something new. I keep on trying to build the same thing. And it's right. not working out. Mm -hmm. You can't force it. One of the greatest lessons I've learned is that, well, okay, I, I don't want to speak in absolutes. There are things that yeah. can be recreated, of course, but mm -hmm. like in a different sense, nothing can be recreated. And, and I think that as musicians and artists and people who are in love with music, especially music is one of those things that's intended to be listened to over and over again. And there is something very special about the fact that you can listen to an album or songs that you loved at any point in your life 
and you can feel a sense of those times. Oh, with, without a doubt. I'm I'm a very sentimental person. Mm-hmm. Um, like I just hang on to things. And <laughs> it's, it's, we oh are. God. We are like. Oh, thank goodness. Thank. Oh, I'm glad I'm not the only one. And it, it, it's funny because uh, like right now, uh, one of my close friends from high school, we both were very, very bonded over music. That's one thing that we often talk about is just like, for instance, uh, the album Psychic Chasms by Neon Indian. I first heard that album nine years ago, and it still feels just as vibrant and alive as it did when I was 16, hanging out in my friend's car, hearing yeah. it for the first time. That's excellent. It's just, it really is really beautiful how music does connect us with parts of our lives and our memories and i i think that's really special because we can stay connected and i think that's something that also i have to try and do is not try and relive certain moments in my life but i can at least take the things i liked about those moments in my life and bring that with me yeah which is really like it's oh god (laughs) (laughs) social distancing is doing something to me man (laughs) I have so much time to think. I feel like I'm like the hermit sitting on their rock, <laughs> just yeah. thinking. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, people like artists, we do have an advantage over people whose hobbies or livelihoods are based on tasks that require a lot of focus and are, are can be distracting. Like if you have a day where you can play guitar and write down ideas all day, you've gained something to take care of seven hours that someone who has nothing like that or desires to, they just have seven hours of boredom. Like advantage of being such a nerd that I can, I can fill time. (laughs) That's, that's the thing for me. I mean, I'll probably never have a lot of money, but I don't think I'll ever be bored, which I'm happy about. Cause when I have been in a more, uh, I guess when I was focusing more on building building my life out of fear, I was way more bored. Right. <laughs> when I was like clinging on to security at all costs, I was way more bored and way more depressed. Life, dude. It's <laughs> yes. It's weird. And like I remember <laughs> I, I I just Exactly. I, yeah, I feel like I don't even have to explain myself, you know? Um, I'm happy where I don't have to explain myself to people anymore, especially with, like, the choices that I, I make in my life. Mm-hmm. As a kid, like, I, I did not do well in school whatsoever. I was ADHD, and it's, it's basically, like, dyslexia for hearing. It's, like, auditory processing. So, some people, they do well with structure, Others don't. I definitely don't. Um, you know, when I when I meet people who may not be around more eccentric ways of being, it's funny because I used to I used to always feel really insecure, and I always felt like I had to explain myself to people. Like right. I used to always just kind of lie and be like, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna like be a music therapist one day," just to give them something to like shut up. <laughs> but at this point, I don't really. I don't care great brenda you work at td like happy for you six figures i don't even know if that's accurate but i just don't care you know especially with the way the world is going it's like does any of this does anything really matter besides trying to be a better person like really on the one hand perhaps money can afford people to see more of the world and and have certain experiences that can be bought but i'm like yeah it's a weird thing for money and material things to matter so much given that one day you're not here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And sorry, it's, from un- it's looking for certainty. Yeah. I don't want to be like money is the devil. Um, Cause that's something when I actually didn't have money <laughs> um, and uh, you know, there was a time in my life where I was living in my van Right. And it's like, oh, wow, like, you know, my, like having security does matter because when you don't have security, it's really hard <laughs> and life gets really stressful. Well, the way I put um, it for me is, is that I don't agree with the machine, but I feel no. like I, I'm not going to get as much done as I want to in life 
if I'm raging against it. Yeah, it's kind of like when, you know, when they're talking about billionaires, they, they've they accumulated so much wealth that they won't even spend a tenth in their lifetime. I will be happy as long as I have a, a nice home and can afford to like take care of my basic needs, you know, and like I'll just figure out the rest because that's just how it's always been. I think that I think that's a thing. I think when people hoard wealth, it's a lack of like inner security because you're so afraid of the uncertainty. So you just like get addicted to this power that you get from money. That's a messy way of living, I think. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds very s- stressful. I feel like I'm already anxious about a lot of stuff, so I couldn't even imagine being even more anxious in that sense. Right. I don't want to make uh, too long of a podcast, although. I do enjoy chatting with you so much that I could go on for a couple hours by the time. Oh, no, this is good. This is fun. I feel (laughs) like we haven't even gotten into it yet. Have you done a lot of interviews? Not, not like this. It's always been where they've sent me the questions and then I fill them out. Okay. Yeah. I I mean, I, I do want to do, at least in this point in my life, I'm shifting back to wanting to ask questions instead of just having go anywhere. But I do like an element of deviate and and stop and smell the roses yeah but i i prefer to have the listener as well as myself and you the guests feel like we're having a conversation more than it's just a strictly q a yeah because those can i think it's it's nice to just kind of let things go the way they're gonna go to reiterate i am a big fan of your music and i i didn't really allow the listener of this to get a sense of via us talking what your music sounds like and about your songwriting itself oh yeah Late January, I was at a show here in Montreal, and I was I was uh, talking to one of my my brother's friends. Um, they were in playing from Toronto, you know, just like small talk. What do you do? What's your music? And I was trying to explain to my my music to the one guy, and he was like, "Oh, so it's like drastic guitar and soft vocals, like pretty melodies, vocals." And I'm like, "Yeah, that that actually sums it up pretty good." <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, Todd here, solo, just doing the editing thing. I decided it would be a great entry point here to present to you one of Peach Guevara's songs from the aforementioned Nude album. After that, you'll have a better idea, and then I'll go back into she and I talking about it. P.S. At the end, I'll be putting in a recording of a brand new song by Peach Guevara. Stay tuned.
bold, yeah, it's like a bold, drastic guitar with very honest vocals, Mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah. I think I ventured to describe it as being like coffeehouse punk. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's, um, Adam who recorded Nude. He, the way he described it was soft punk. I think that's hitting it. Yeah. Again, with any word you can describe a genre with, there's like a wide spectrum. And if I were to narrow more down, when I say punk, I would think of things that I really love. Yeah. And and when I say coffee house, I mean things that I really love. Whereas there's people that come into the coffee house saying, I feel raw about things and I want to express myself. And that's when I would hear the kind of stuff that made me feel the way I felt the first time I heard your nude EP. Is it the EP? Yeah, EP. Yeah, I guess EP. It's only seven songs. So seven songs qualifies to the Grammys as a as an album. Oh, well then. Yeah, that's that's still a new thing, old man Donald. So <laughs> Were you aware before you started putting yourself out there that there was a scene? Yeah. The first time I went to Montreal, I was from Toronto, 18. Right? Or Southwestern no, I'm Ontario. From Sarnia, Ontario okay. originally. I lived in Toronto before I moved to BC, which is where I lived before I moved to Montreal. I remember going to Montreal for the first time. You know, it was midsummer. It was a really fun weekend because like Pride was going on. While also I was there for Oceaga, so it was just like this big party. I'm this like kid from this small town in this city that's just like so full of life and so booming. And I had the best weekend of my life. I can't say that I remember it very well because, <laughs> you know, 18 was the legal drinking age in Quebec and I was 18. So um, among other things, <laughs> a blurry weekend. It was funny going back to Toronto after that weekend because I was like, why the hell am I going to school in Toronto? Like Montreal seems way more alive and more of a place that's well suited for me because I was 2013 and I moved to Montreal in 2019. So yeah, for like six years, I just thought about this place and thought about playing music there. And what inspired me to move there was I was playing a show and this was when I was living in BC uh, with a band that was from Montreal. They're working on solo projects right now, but the band is called St. Lowe. They're a really lovely band. And I, so I played a gig with them and asked them about Montreal. And they're like, oh yeah, if you're a musician, you should live there. Like, what are you doing in Victoria? And I was like, what am I doing in Victoria? Upon moving there, as someone who's moved from a bigger city to a smaller place, like when I moved from Toronto to Vancouver Island, It is so much easier finding at least community in a scene going into a smaller community. Right. Because it's like, yeah, you can play shows in Montreal, but I think it takes a lot more time to develop community within a scene. And I think that's what matters more than anything, because that's what that's what keeps it going. You know, when there is that community and there is that solidarity and support. You know, it's funny, I thought I was going to move to Montreal and just like hit the ground running and just be playing shows, do, 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 do. But before I could do that, I really needed to take time to get my confidence up first of all, because it was like I was moving into a bigger music scene. And, you know, like every artist, I deal with a lot of self-doubt and I deal with a lot of stage fright, like, oh, God to the point where I just feel like I'm going to die. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then add and on to that, your nervous system in this new place. Exactly. Right. And it, when I put my first show in Montreal in January, I'd moved to Montreal in February of 2019. And then I didn't get my first show organized till January of 2019, 2020, because um, I just needed that time. I needed that time to like get my confidence up figure out what I wanted to show people, you know, Yeah. especially because music is so personal and it's always developing and changing. So I was like, do I want to play all my old stuff from when I was in BC, from when I was in a different environment, I was a totally different person, or do I want to play stuff from where I'm at now? And I think that's what had to happen. Like when I finally got off stage, I was like, wow, that was, that was just like playing anywhere in the world. I've played in in lots of different scenarios and venues. What just matters most is just having a really intimate audience Mm -hmm. that you're just really connected. We're just like everything flows, you know, there's no awkwardness. There's no needing to explain why you're up there. Everything just 
just meshes and a really lovely shared experience. And I think that's Mm -hmm. what matters the most when it comes to performing is being able to create something meaningful. I mean, on Facebook, it's like, post an album that means something to you. And I posted a do a little by the Pixies and someone had commented how, you know, one of their best memories was being at a Pixies concert. And as they were playing their set, the entire audience sang along the entire time. And like, if, if I could have a moment like that, where I'm singing to an audience and they're singing right with me and they're feeling everything that I'm feeling, like I, I can die very happy. <laughs> I, I think I could like get hit by a car shortly after that and it would be okay. Yeah, no, go, go, big. So go big, go big, go yeah. <laughs> big. Go big and then... I could have like, a, you know? a World War I plane crash a kilometer away and then have one of the the jet spokes fly off and just zing me and then the blood would let slowly i would just be slowly I want like, going i want like a donnie darko death you know right? where i just go into my house and i climb into my bed with the biggest smile on my face and an airplane engine falls on me and the <laughs> I'm moment- sorry, that's really morbid if my mom hears this she's gonna be like ah. you gotta you gotta you gotta take something negative and poke fun at it if i didn't yeah. have such a sick sense of humor i honestly don't know what i would do it makes my life and day-to-day a lot easier i think truly po- I, I have nothing to back this up i'm not that smart i just think that truly positive people can laugh at almost anything oh yeah and you know it's it's funny because um like my music is obviously like, it's how I I get out my more uh, harder feelings to process. Mm -hmm. I honestly do have a really good sense of humor. I I laugh a lot. Just to go back to what you were saying before about the experiences of performing and how it means more, when there's more of a connection with the audience, if I were to compare the best gigs I've ever had with the ones that just felt like tedium, okay, well, at least I'm getting paid. It's like just the way the the body and the mind works in producing chemicals and that word that everyone uses a lot more nowadays, mindfulness. The best gigs are the ones where you don't want to be anywhere in your mind than where exactly where you are in those moments. Whereas you're playing, but you're distracted by the fact that people aren't listening to you. And so you have to perform robotically and then you're not able to take in all the information because you're distracted. Oh, yeah. Even if not now your worst gig now will have a a nice memory to offer you later on who knows but it seems like oh definitely it seems like you have um a good backlog of of, uh, of experiences but in the spirit of what you were saying of foundations crumbling and rebuilding that you're still approaching things with a newness yeah i mean take with you what works but always try and like step into the unknown you know and Mm -hmm. because you never know what will come out of it you might just develop something of your own. The second last gig I played before COVID, it was this cafe here in Montreal called Cafe Tuski. Being the opener, let me tell you, like if you're going to go see a show, show up for the opener because it's very nerve wracking and it's, you know, you practice just as hard as everyone else. And then yeah. and there's only like two people there. It's come on, <laughs> like get there early. But in some ways it was so nice. Cause like the people who were there were so they were with me Yeah, and I didn't have that feeling of people weren't listening. And because of that, I was able to relax and be silly. And that's part of my persona. Like I'm just, I'm a, I'm a silly gal. It was nice to just be able to be myself on stage rather than like trying to win people over. Cause that, that it just takes so much energy when you're trying to remember all these songs and all these chord progressions and taking all this stuff and then people aren't even with you. But like at the very end, there was this little girl, she's maybe like three, and she started singing with me at the top of her lungs. That just made, you know, there could have been a full house there and I could have been the person ending the night or the, the headliner or whatever. But just to have this like little girl sing at the top of her lungs with me, it just made me really happy because I remember being that little girl. I remember just like saying to 
her dad after and I'm like, oh, like, you know, you might have a singer songwriter on your hands. Like she can keep pitch pretty well. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, like, oh, I hope so too. And, and that just made me really happy. That's excellent. Yeah. I don't know why I said all that, but anyways. <laughs> to, <laughs> to communicate, to communicate with me. Yeah. Into the Words world. come out. I'm gonna chop this up and make you look so stupid, man. Is gonna <laughs> you're gonna ruin me. No, I'm I'm really excited to hear what you put out there next and however you decide to to navigate, you know, what you do artistically from here, whether or not you're gonna do it as a career or uh for art's sake or both. And I fucking I think there's a lot of brilliance from your music, the what the stuff that's available. And um uh, good luck with that. No, sorry, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't know how to finish the sentence. Um, you're, but, you're good. You're good. Uh, it makes me really happy. And I hope we stay friends. Oh, definitely, for sure. Maybe once this whole COVID thing ends, we can uh, have a an actual interview here in Montreal. Go yeah. see a show or something, and or play uh, one. That too. I mean, actually, funny enough, today I wrote a new song and. I'm really excited for what's to come and what I'll have to share. I really hope that, you know, even at the age of 92, I can still like somehow make noise and somehow record it and share it with people. Like I've tried to do other things that make me happy and it's just, it's not the same, you know, (laughs) I may, I may have to rent and live with roommates for the rest of my life. As long as I'm not bored, it'll be okay. There you go. Yeah. You know? It was mentioned on your website. I I, I did steal from your website <laughs> some knowledge of the fact that in some way, shape, or form, your next album is on its way to, to existing. I'm just looking forward to it. Me too. For those. <laughs> <laughs> I am looking forward. Yeah. Honestly, it'll I think this this album more than anything. I will feel very satisfied with its completion because I think it's going to have all the layers that I would hope my album to have and being in the sense, you know, it's not just going to be all guitar and vocals. Like, I'm hoping to be playing with a band. There's even going to be some spoken word in some parts. There's going to be some more ambient things going on. What fucks me up the most is when I go into something with a, an exact cutout. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm going into this as if it's like jello, and <laughs> there's a mold, but there's no blueprint. Right. Nothing that can't be changed or played with. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to do this. This is my first time Zoom recording a podcast. It was great to finally Ooh. to have you on the show, given that I've already been a fan of yours for a while. Aww. Thank you. No, I, I honestly like I it makes me really happy to have someone excited about my music because I'm not always excited about my music. I really appreciate that. So thank you. OK, this is Peach Guevara playing my very, very fresh song. I don't think it's just barely over 24 hours old. Uh, this song is called Stay Soft.
Thanks for listening to another episode of The Todd Donald Show. Starring, produced, and edited by Todd Donald. The piano music in the rap is by J.P. Sunga, who you can find at jpsunga.com. The theme music is Mackie Alkino by William Chernoff. Find him at chernoff.band. And I'm Milo Axelrod, Todd's favorite bar none human voice. And I'm not bragging, he wrote this. If you'd like to hear more of my voice, check out my podcast, Describing a Rock, in which I describe some rocks. You can find it wherever you listen to podcasts. Please support The Todd Donald Show by sharing it with anyone who might enjoy it. Follow and interact with at Todd Donald Show on Twitter and Instagram. And if you feel like going the extra mile on iTunes, please subscribe, rate, and review, preferably in its favor. Have a great day, friends.